For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. Thanks for joining us for this live stream discussion of communities living near fossil fuel facilities and their role in addressing climate change. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these lands for 10,000 years. We'd love to hear from you today, so please share your questions in the comment section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. It drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. Everybody uses fossil fuels every day, but most people never get close to a power plant or oil refinery. Maybe you see them from afar while driving on the freeway or in a video. Today, we'll talk about people who live in fence line communities and explore their complicated relationships with facilities that generate jobs, taxes, and pollution. I'm delighted to welcome four excellent guests. Derek Hawley is president of Reaching America, a nonprofit he founded that addresses issues facing Black Americans. Jackie Patterson is director of the Environmental and Just Climate Justice at the NAACP. Ivan Penn is an energy reporter with the New York Times. And Vien Trong is director of climate justice with Tom Tyre. Tom Tyre. Tom, who's that guy? Vien Trong is climate direct. <laughs> Vien Trong is director of climate justice for Tom Steyer's PAC. Ivan Penn, I'd like to begin with you. Your excellent reporting was the inspiration for this episode. You wrote earlier this year about Adora Nwese, the president of the NAACP's Florida Conference. In 2014, she wrote an op-ed in the Tallahassee Democrat opposing a solar energy rebate program. A couple of months later, you reported the NAACP issued an invoice to Florida's largest utility for $50,000. Tell us that story. Sure. Well, it's good to be with you. Um, yeah, we, we were reached out. Uh, we, re we had some folks reach out to us about uh, the desire actually of Adora and Wese to share her concerns uh, as a co-panelist uh, here, Jackie Patterson, um, and some of the work that the NAACP has been doing in recent years, highlighted the fact that uh, there, the effects of climate change on Floridians um, were significant enough to reevaluate the Florida State Conference's support of the utility industry, which had been funding the state conference a great deal, um, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and in general, what had been happening even during regulatory meetings was that the NAACP uh, would, would typically support the positions of the utility companies, um, generally arguing that some of the policies that uh, were pro-renewable, uh, pro-energy efficiency, uh, raised questions about the impact on communities of color, uh, on the disadvantaged. They seemed more benefits in the purview of the wealthy who could afford solar panels, who could afford uh, energy star appliances, who could afford to weatherize their homes, leaving the disadvantaged to pay the cost of the electric grid uh, while those who could more afford it um, were reducing how much they had to pay to the utility. And so what we saw and what we reported uh, in this story uh, was in Adora and Wese came forward and said, hey, you know, I realized after a study that 
uh, the NAACP had done, that there were severe negative impacts on co the communities of color in Florida, uh, which obviously uh, you have significant concerns uh, in Florida between the hurricanes, sea level rise, um, you know, and flooding. And she recognized that they had to do something different. And she shared that story with us. Jackie Patterson, other chapters of the NAACP had similar uh, postures in 2017. I've been reported the Illinois chapter also opposed solar power and stronger energy efficiency measures in 2018. NAACP's top executive in California signed a letter opposing renewable energy. Paint the picture for us of this broader pattern of um, these communities of color in relation to the energy companies who often are very close to them. Yeah, thank you. In in many cases, what we're finding as uh, with the NAACP leadership is a very is varying experiences, but one common thread is a concern around the the what they would what they would be concerned would be negative impacts of making this shift. As as Ivan said, the the uh, analysis around people having to pay higher bills for their electricity. Um, people losing jobs and so forth. And the NAACP, when knowing that this nation was built on regressive policies that disproportionately negatively impact us, there it was fairly easy for the fossil fuel companies to, to really uh, paint a picture of these negative impacts and, and, and a fairly myopic picture of the negative impacts that made, made uh, our NAACP leaders say, okay, yet again, Here's another situation where it's advantaging people with wealth and dis to the at the expense of our communities, and so that is the fertile ground on which the um, the the seeds of doubt were, were planted that resulted in some of these these uh, positions. So this this argument that. Uh... You know, solar panels, you know, benefits white people, Jackie, if I heard you kind of, uh, fit nicely into a narrative of how this power is used in this country. Of course, the white people get advantaged and the people of color get the get the dirty stuff. So it fit exactly. right in. Yeah. OK. Um, Chevron's oil refinery in Richmond, California, is so old it was built before the surrounding city even existed. And for a long time, there wasn't much. So it's, you know, propaganda organ for them. Soto's ultimate goal is the decommissioning of the Chevron refinery. And he says other energy producing communities across the country should try and develop economic transition plans so that they can one day do the same. Having a large industrial facility in your community, whether it's an oil refinery or a steel mill or a smelter or any you know, cement plant, it is going to bring revenue, but there has to be a different way of evaluating cost benefit. When you start adding up all those, the cost of health care, the loss of productivity, the loss of life expectancy, increased poverty of people who grow up along the fence line of these facilities versus the amount of income that is brought in through taxation it then starts to become a different kind of equation. It's just no longer good enough to look at it from dollars and cents. We also need to look at it from the health of the planet. That was Andre Soto, an organizer with the Richmond, California branch of Communities for a Better Environment. Derek Colley, I'd like to have your response there to his comments about balancing the economic and human health benefits of large energy facilities. Well, sure, and thanks for having me today, Greg. Um, a couple of things. One, um, I think it's very unfortunate the things that happened to him and his family. Um, and I also think it's unfortunate that they are not able to prove or associate Chevron with whatever it was that took place with his family. Um, 
One of the issues that, you know, Greg, that we work on the most is, is energy poverty. Energy poverty occurs when individuals aren't able to afford just basic heating and electric needs. And um, I think the technology over the years has changed a lot. I think he said this has been five decades since that power plant was built, uh, was built prior to the community being, being built. And I think the technology has changed a lot. Who knows what went into that facility prior to, uh, you know, when it, was, when it was first built? Again, the technology has changed a lot. It probably has a lot of the old systems in place and, and we still don't know the effects of it. But I think in moving forward, and we talked about this yesterday, you know, Greg, I'm not a fan of anything that's polluting the environment. And we talked about a plant down here in Southern Maryland that should have been shut down a long time ago. But I also think there's a, there's a balance that we have to have in terms of our approach towards energy and development and being good steward, stewardships of the environment. And I would point to um, Port Fouchon down in Louisiana. I had an opportunity to visit Port Fouchon, Louisiana a couple of years ago. And this is where they have all the onshore operations for all the offshore operations that take place for BP, Shell, all the big oil companies. And um, it's just interesting because people travel from around the world to study the Gulf because it's so rich in fish and wildlife. And I think again, and I'm a licensed captain. I, I love the water, took my boat from Maryland to Florida, and I'm a, I, I, I'm a true steward of the environment. But I think you gotta find that balance between our energy development, production, and keeping the environment safe. And Trug, I'd like to ask you one comment in there was about a softer approach. You know, the, the, the company came in, came in kind of heavy handed and then they took a softer approach. And there's a you know, well told story about uh, the company handing out backpacks uh, for kids to take to school and, and giving tangible things uh, to the community. So, you know, a fair amount about Richmond, what's happened there. You know, has it gotten cleaner over time? And your view on the balance of kind of the environment and it provides a lot of jobs. For the end? You're mute. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Would you mind repeating that? Um, yeah, Vien Trung, your take on you know what Andre Soto was talking about in terms of the uh, the, the softer approach that Chevron has taken in, in Richmond. You know, there's a well-told story about handing out backpacks for kids to go to school and and being well received by the company there, perhaps in some ways uh, better than some of the environmental groups. Right. And, you know, as you said earlier, Richmond, Richmond's refinery has been there for a long time and many people went there to get the jobs and it was considered a company town. And as part of their work in building their communities, they were doing some of the you know work with building relationships, including giving out these backpacks. Um, what we haven't seen is the corollary with a lot of climate groups. They're coming in there and they're saying these are things that are bad for your environment, they're bad for your life and longevity. And that's true. And many people in the communities know that. There just isn't an alternative. So what we often do is what we have not learned to do well is to go from protest to actually creating solutions. How do we offer an alternative? How do we actually invest in the communities to actually give, give and create more jobs? How do we build the inroads? You know, when we hear, hear about um, organizations that respond um, against the increase in utility costs because it will actually hurt the low income uh, pay, rate payers even more. That makes a whole lot of sense to me. You know, we're in a place in America right now where most families don't have $500 in their savings account before COVID. And now when you look at what's happening, you know, the the, the evisceration of our healthcare systems, the lack of ability for people to have their own social safety net. We don't have retirement savings in many of our uh, communities. The cost of living in California is so high. We're seeing cities across the street from where we live. And so when you talk about increasing the cost of energy, which is fundamental for survival, especially during these days, of course, it makes sense for us to respond in kind. What I would say, though, is that it shouldn't be seen as a false dichotomy. It shouldn't be either or. What would have been a better solution there should have been a great learning lesson to say what the organization should have done in the first place is to go to the communities to discuss what are the right solutions and how do we work together to actually create a better solution. Um, and had they done that, they would have realized that there is a better way to actually be more nuanced in creating policies, which I think is what we're learning to do now. So 
Um, I'm glad that now we're beginning to talk about these incidences and case studies where we begin to create an option for us to actually build better relationships, to actually work together with stakeholders so that we're not making a false choice between our environment and our economy. Greg's having some connectivity issues. Stand by, please. Great. That was a bad answer. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> really awkwardly quiet. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> Oops. Did uh, you guys, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, Jackie Patterson, so when economies like Richmond, California try to diversify, um, oftentimes there's questions of displacement or gentrification that are very painful when a community like Richmond tries to diversify away from just the oil refinery and they have a, a big university research center, some a ferry terminal with some housing. Then the community is like, hey, we're getting priced out of here. So how do they grow out of a, you know, diversify and grow out without hurting the people who were there? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, as you can imagine, it's one of many communities that are facing the same challenges. And one of the, actually, if, if our annual convention had moved forward um, this year, although it's happening a, a little bit later, our workshop was going to focus on this whole issue of gentrification, displacement, and how do we grow and have community um, improvement without community displacement. And so we have been putting together a suite of of ordinances that could be put in place to help to 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 put the types of uh, measures in place that would help to 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 uh, mitigate against the displacement that happens. And based on some of the some of the practices where people have been successful in doing community improvement without displacing communities, so we're still digging deep on that on that uh, on that research so that we can really put forward those models. But it is possible to do, but then the important thing is making sure the communities are in the driver's seat so that the improvement isn't something that happens to them and therefore the displacement being more likely if they're driving it and know what measures they can put in place to, to, uh, to prevent displacement, then we'll, we'll most likely kind of have a win-win situation. And Ivan Penn, you've written that energy companies understood the importance of diversity before a lot of environmental groups did. Uh, environmental groups kind of tend to come into these communities, often white, saying, hey, these companies are bad, they're killing the planet and you. But the energy companies have been there uh, and recognize are more diverse and more part of that community. Ivan Penn? Well, uh, they, the, the energy companies have to recognize that in order for them to um, get the political support that they need, they they have to draw in a diverse group of, of people. So as we talked about at the beginning, the idea of drawing in uh, communities of color uh, by funding, uh, not just uh, the NAACP, but you, you see it, it's sort of prolific throughout um, communities of color, nonprofit organizations to build a coalition. Um, and in some cases uh, that has gone to the extreme of, uh, of the, you know, the term noun of astroturfing, the, the counter to grassroots movements to try to build this diverse, uh, at least a public perception of a diverse coalition in support of uh, their projects. They also recognized, uh, especially in the, in the last decade, um, the not only the diversification of their coalition, but that they've had to contend with something that they didn't anticipate, and in, in particular, solar power uh, and its uh, effects on 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 all energy. Um, how it is changing both the utility sector, how uh, it, it's affecting uh, the transportation sector, and and the need to electrify and when you start looking at the, the diversification of the energy sources, then they're having to evaluate their whole business model. Um, how do we contend with all of these things that a hundred years ago, when, uh, when we had, when we offered universal electric service, when transportation um, became, automobiles became a, a core part of our 
uh, of our transportation system, it didn't anticipate all these different types of things, people delivering power to the electric grid, um, not needing gasoline and instead driving an, an electric vehicle. Uh, these are things that they hadn't anticipated. And so they've needed to diversify for their own survival. Stand by while Greg rejoins. Tyler, I can hear you. But no one can hear. We can hear you now, Greg. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right, there we are. Um, so Derek Colley, you want to respond to that? I was going to say, Ivan, you nailed it with that. We was on point with everything. And I would just add to it, Greg, is sort of what we touched on uh, in our conversation. And that is, over the years, everything that Ivan said, the, the, the oil and gas companies, because they, they, they've gotten arrogant, and complacent over the years because of everything that Ivan has said. They've had no competition. And now all of a sudden, this new renewable, this green energy train is coming down the tracks right now. <laughs> and I think they've, they've waited too late to try to get out in front of it and try to stop it. And so I think that's right. That's why the world right now, I think is so open to hearing from renewables and what they can do. Uh, now, are, are the renewables the solution? I'm not gonna go as far as to say that because they haven't proven to be as of yet. However, I do believe and think that again, over the years, because there's been no competition for oil and gas, they've gotten a little complacent. And I agree with what Ivan said. Jim Trung, in 2016, Hillary Clinton offered a $30 billion plan to help coal workers. Um, often that was focused on retraining. We hear a lot about re retraining you've been involved in green jobs um does that really ever happen does that i mean we hear about it but does that really happen i think well that's a big question does it really happen uh, sure in different pockets and specificity i think what what i would look back at at the 30 billion is it needed to be unpacked about where was the money going to be spent and how this transition was going to work with a lot more specificity needed mm -hmm. and making sure that we're working with people who are in those industries to look at what is a real rational plan that's not very abstract that's looking at you know for folks who are in the older tiers ready to retire what does that look mm -hmm. like for the transition right what does it look like to make sure that you continue to have the benefits you need the pension that you had and making sure that you have the safety net for your family and oftentimes you know, in the um, previously there was a, a single person household that's carrying the weight, the economic weight of the whole family on this one income and making sure that the family is protected. And if there's a, um, if people are kind of in the middle tier, how do we make sure that they have the right skill set? What kind of industries do they have in the nearby vicinity that they can actually get connected to with the with a reasonably uh, level amount of wages and the same kind of corresponding benefits? And then for the younger folks, how do we make sure that we're continuing to get them kind of directed at cleaner jobs or better jobs? And how do we make sure that the whole of the community actually has other options and economic diversity for other, um, other places to work besides just your fossil fuel industries? And that's where I think that 30 billion could have been better unpacked and, and kind of brought in folks who are, are proximate to the problem or proximate to what's going on to help design the solutions. And I think that's the learning lesson that we have here. How do we make sure that, you know, whether you're working at a very local level or at the federal level, that we don't do things in a vacuum or in silos. We are now more interconnected than ever before. We have to start bringing in folks to help make sure that we're creating solutions that make sense for everybody, right? You can't create solutions. I mean, for a long time, um, you know, my family's refugee folks from Vietnam, for a long time, policy is done to people and not with people. 
And now we're at a place where we understand that we have to make sure that we are um, not only creating a seat at the table for people who are proximate to the problem, but bring the table to the community that you're trying to create policies that actually affect and make sure that they're co-creating the solutions with us, you know, with the policymakers, with the different folks who are actually helping to shape the future so that we can design something that makes sense with all the stakeholders involved. You're on mute, Greg. Sure, I'm on the phone too. Um, um, if you're just joining us, we're talking about uh, fossil fuel communities uh, and, and climate change in communities of color with Derek Colley, president of Reaching America, Jackie Patterson, director of environmental and climate justice at the NAACP, Ivan Penn's energy reporter with the New York Times, and Vien Trong, director of climate justice with the Tom Steyer PAC. Um, Ivan Penn, I'd like to talk to you about you know, this jobs transition. People hear about that light, you know, what are coal miners gonna do? But the jobs in clean energy are very different types of jobs, often in a very different place. That that's right, uh, and the and you, you're talking about a significant difference in 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 pay, um, where you are going from uh, nuclear jobs, um, which are obviously very high paying jobs, uh, a reactor. You could have 600 people uh, at a at a plant, whereas you know a solar farm uh, after it's built, uh, I mean you essentially have a guy with a squeegee, um, and and <laughs> and so I mean those those are those are real 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 issues. Um, you have you have a lot of jobs created um, in the development and installation of solar and wind. Uh, but you don't have as many uh, as as the fossil fuel uh, and and other big box power plants. Um, there is a lot of training that that companies uh, have been providing in this transition. But uh, you know, recently wrote a story about some of the competition between renewables and natural gas now, and. There was a uh, a power plant closed in uh, North Dakota, uh, Underwood, North Dakota, and the utility was switching to uh, wind and 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 natural gas from coal. That is a devastating um, uh, uh, decision to the small town there, uh, that depended on not only the power plant but also the coal mine that supplied that power plant. And now that town is wondering, well, what are we gonna do? And the other nearby small towns. So, you know, there are some real issues. And, and the question is, uh, how, how, do, how, how does the, the country navigate the transition uh, that increasingly all parties are embracing in order to deal with climate change? Jackie Patterson, I was an internet reporter in the early days of the internet. And the thinking then was that it was going to democratize information, that there were going to be so many sources of information, lots of competition, this um, sort of moving away from centralization of you know, IBM and, and mainframe computers. Now we have a situation where a handful of large companies dominate the internet that democratization didn't happen. And I hear similar, that echoes for me some of the conversations about distributed power is gonna be more democratic and people, you can you know, give power to the people from their rooftops. I'd like to hear your thoughts on kind of the concentration and distribution of power as we move from a fossil economy to a cleaner economy. You might have a replay of the same kind of, same story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is um, kind of to the some of the points that were being made before we started this initiative called the Black Labor Initiative on Just Transition, so that we really make sure that we are centering the voices of people who are standing to lose um, their livelihoods in this in this transition. And in that conversation with the with the Black Labor um, um, folks in the lead, we've been talking about how how currently the centralized power has resulted in circumstances such as 
uh, the 76,000 um, coal miners that have li lost their lives since 1968, while the National Mining Association, which consisted of the very companies that employed them, fought against the regulations to, to be able to protect them from the coal mine dust that, that is tied to the black lung disease that, that, that took their lives, and that has and that's in counting. And so we've talked about how not only um, is the lobbying against uh, uh, those types of regulations, but it's also a, a number of these fossil fuel companies are paying into groups like ALEC that, um, that push forward on everything from school and prison privatization to water privatization to even voter suppression laws. And so that that centralization of power and the and the lack of real people engagement and what and what uh, what is um, in that agenda and 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 for our for our communities it's at the expense of the the uh, well being of our communities points to us for the need of, of, of decentralizing the the wealth and the power that's driving that machine and so for us it is uh, it and, and in the context of the conversation with the Black Labor Initiative it's really talking about how do we what are the what are the possibilities not just thinking of trading a job in in doing coal or oil and gas for another energy job or even but what are the what are the vast pop possibilities in the new economy that we're trying to to, to transition to and so and in each of, uh, of the sectors of this new economy, we are uh, we have a lot of folks who are pushing for decentralization because whether it's people getting their electricity shut off for non-payment while the the company that's you know responsible for it is has a CEO making nine point eight million dollars a year and you're cutting somebody off for sixty dollars to the to literally at the cost of their lives. Our report lights mm -hmm. out in the coal talked about people who were burning candles for electricity after having their I mean for light after having their electricity cut off and burned down their houses. So they literally mm -hmm. paid the price of poverty with their lives. And so to this point around energy poverty, we are really looking at and how how do we actually really uh, meaningfully and systemically relieve um, energy poverty um, that really does put the, the power in both senses in the hands of the people. So, Derek, Derek Holly, your grandfather was a coal miner. Um, and a lot of your writings, uh, you, you, you cite the Heritage Foundation as an authoritative source. I wonder what you think about the prospect of coal in America. Is it going to come back, as Donald Trump claims? Um, <laughs> no, I don't think uh, there's going to be a comeback with the coal. I just don't. Um, for a couple of different reasons. One, as I, I, like we talked about uh, coal, I've watched it because my grandfather was a black coal miner in Southwest Virginia. And I've seen right now coal represents about 28, 29% of our entire energy mix. And I've seen it decline over the years. I, when I started this thing reaching America about five or six years ago, coal was up like 34, 35%. And just in five, six years, it's gone down to 29, 28%. And I think we're going to continue to see that decrease in coal for one reason. One, because natural gas is cleaner, it's more efficient, we have it in abundance. And so while I think coal will continue to decrease in terms of our, our, our electric mix and energy supply goes, I think coal will always be around, always be around because we still need it for different materials, i.e. windmills, solar panels, and that kind of thing, that will still keep coal in place, but not to the level where it is right now. I've but I, I I also, I want to just also, if I could okay. add, just with the, with the loss of the jobs that we were just talking about, I had the opportunity to go back to Southwest Virginia and visit where my grandfather was a coal miner. And that area still, 50 years later, has never rebounded. And you talk about poverty. In the Appalachia, it is so different from that in an urban city. Like I said, I couldn't, I lost count of the number of homes whose the roofs were damaged and they just had a blue tarp on the top of it with tires holding it down because they couldn't afford to get their, their, uh, their, their roofs fixed. And poverty, like I said, just runs rampant in Appalachia. It's because of the loss of the, loss of the, uh, the coal mines there. And they, they tried to uh, replace some of those jobs by opening prisons, that's not the answer either, either. But it's going to be very difficult as we continue with some of these proposals that are being put forth right now 
that are trying to eliminate oil and gas jobs. I just wonder, as uh, Ben was saying, how do you retrain a workforce who's at the golden years, almost to the end of retirement? Where does that money come from for them? And so that's why I just say, we just need to hold on pump our brakes as we transition to renewables, just make sure that everyone is taken care of is in our effort as we continue to do that. As we continue our conversation about com communities of color and fossil fuel facilities around America, we're gonna to go to our lightning round on Climate One. I'm gonna ask each of you a true or false question, just one word, uh, first, you know, true or false, and then we'll go to a association. Uh, so beginning with Derek Holly, true or false, cafe standards for American cars and trucks were flat for nearly 25 years from 1985 to 2009 when President Obama proposed a 5% annual increase. True or false? True. Flat for 25 years. Uh, true or false? <laughs> Jacqueline Patterson, um, fossil fuels have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Hundreds of millions, false. <laughs> Um, uh, Derek Holly, true or false, fossil fuel companies place refinery, refineries and power plants in neighborhoods populated by people of color. This is a true or false question. True or false. <laughs> fossil fuel, yeah. I would say in the past, yes, true, absolutely. Um, also absolutely. follow up true or false because those people have less political power. I would say yes, yes. Ivan true. Penn, true or false, Wall Street prefers solar energy on residential rooftops rather than industrial installations. Uh, false. Vien Trung, true or false, climate philanthropy in this country is dominated by a handful of billionaire white men named such as Bloomberg, Steyer, Simons, Grantham, and others. <laughs> Quasi true. There's so many, here's why. I mean, I work. I work for one of those guys. Um, All right. There are so many more foundations and family foundations and people that are coming up and actually doing the work, and so that misses the amazing work that so many other people are actually doing. So, um, in that case, like there's some there's some folks in the, in the um, getting a lot of attention, but it actually is being done by a bunch of other folks. Uh, once again, yeah, the, the white guys get the attention. Uh, okay, true or false, Ivan Penn. Uh, Duke Energy compelled one Florida homeowner to buy a million dollar insurance policy because it said the solar panels on his home could harm the electric grid. True or uh, false? Th th uh, that would be true. <laughs> um, Vien Trung, true or false? Wall Street likes cap and trade because they can game it. True. Derek Holly, uh, true or false, you have received direct or indirect funding from fossil fuel interests. Mm, true. Um, this is an association. I'm just gonna mention something and uh, ask you to think of the first thing that pops in your mind off the top of your head with reckless abandon. Um, Jackie Patterson, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say green jobs? Green washing. <laughs> uh, also, for, also Jackie Patterson, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say the the suspense. <laughs> we can fill in the blanks there. Right? There's lots of possibilities. Word that comes to mind when. I lost you for a little bit, Greg. Can you repeat it? What's, what's, the, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's position on climate change policy? I would say hopefully evolving. <laughs> Ivan Penn, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say Florida power and light? Uh, <laughs> influential. <laughs> also, Ivan Penn, what's the first thing that comes to mind, top of mind, when I say Florida Governor Ron DeSantis? Uh, 
current governor. <laughs> <laughs> the Dodge. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> uh, Vien Trung, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say all lives matter? Black lives matter. Also, Vien Trung, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say Mount Rushmore? Indigenous rights first. Derek Holly, first things that comes to mind when I say voter fraud. The uh, November, I think it's November, the election. Last one, uh, Derek Holly, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say Donald Trump? Woo! <laughs> That's what comes to mind. Woo! <laughs> All right. Thanks for uh, getting through the, the lightning round. That was a really good job. Um, I, I've been paying, you know, we pledged in, in Climate One to talk in all of our programs about race and concentration of power. I'd like to come back to this concentration of power question. You know, with the you cover the energy industry and there's a lot of consolidated, very powerful fossil fuel companies. Where, how is power distributed on the other side, solar and wind companies? Are they big corporations? Are they smaller companies? Are, are they, you know, are they consolidated? What's the power on the, other, on the other side, the clean side compared to the fossil side? Well, uh, obviously when you have a, a younger uh, industry, so uh, not the same level of influence, um, you do have, um, a consolidation of power through through the associations. Um, the on the solar side, the major uh, major one is the Solar Energy Industries Association, and that is uh, that that's made up of all of the solar players. So um, so you have a mix there where uh, it's the utilities, it's um, the uh, industrial commercial. Um, install those who get it installed on the industrial and commercial side. And then there's the rooftop uh, solar businesses that are installing in residences and, and all. Uh, so that becomes a significant voice because of the, the numbers of players that uh, are working together. The wind association, um, you know, is a significant voice with the, all of the onshore and now the developing uh, offshore wind. And then when you combine those those voices of, uh, and of course the growing storage industry, and when you combine those voices together, you know, it becomes a, a significant block, but the dynamics are very, very different uh, for the renewables and, uh, and, and, and we've talked about the, the, and the voice of the consumer um, as opposed to the energy industry, which has uh, organizations that are are unified nationally uh, and even internationally, and they have a narrative and a script that the renewable side is beginning to develop. Um, the consumers are are much more fragmented and don't have the same kind of voice. Uh, that that either one of these parties do, and are trying to navigate the 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 push and the lobbying from each one of these industries, and and at the end of the day, the big question is, uh, you know, where's the grown up in the room that should be the regulators <laughs> and the government to to help the consumer to navigate the push, especially in a capitalist society, by these different industries that are trying to win their dollars. Um, and, and so even though you're the, I mean, you have the bigger voice of the oil, natural gas, um, uh, utility industries versus the growing renewable sector, um, there's the masses though are, uh, you know, caught in this place of not having the kind of voice that they need so that they can make informed decisions about both their government and their lives. Derek Carley, I think you you seem to be right of center politically. You know, what your thought on, on where government um, 
is in terms of regulating industry uh, and the energy industry in this country, because I know a lot of conservatives who don't like the idea of monopolies. They want market competition. Your thoughts on sort of the power structure of energy and how the government's um, overseeing that <clears throat> sector? Well, I think um, a lot of times, again, it's it's the 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 the, the, the general public. They don't have a voice. And I think a lot of times they are misled by both sides. And I'd say that, you know, the oil and gas, from where I sit, the oil and gas, as I shared with you, I think they do need to do a better job of informing the public of what they do, the uses of fossil fuels, and et cetera. Meanwhile, from where I sit, the environmental groups, i.e. the Sierra Club, they are bombarding people, telling people that it's so bad. Natural gas is bad. Everything, fossil fuels is bad. Keep it in the ground. Don't pull it up all those kinds of things. So people right now are just like, oh my God. And, it, and it's, it's coming down to who they even vote for in the November election. Is it gonna be uh, uh, the new Green Deal with Joe Biden or is it gonna be you know, uh, fossil fuels with President Trump? And so, and the thing about it is again, it's misleading to people because on the side with Joe Biden, I know most of those people, black people in particular, are not in the market to buy an electric vehicle. But meanwhile, but that's where this, with this, with that, with that policy, the policy they're putting out, and with the direction of, of, of a Joe Biden, that's what you're going to be having. You're going to have to do that. And I don't think people really, really understand when it comes to policy and the politics involved when it comes to energy, because both people, both the, the left, the right, the environmental groups, the oil and gas industries are just throwing so much at people, and it just, it's just hard to decipher what's, what's best for. Them. Pintro, you used to work a long time with uh, Van Jones and had an organization called Green for All. Is that narrative mm -hmm. true that that um, electric cars are for mostly for white people? Oh, perhaps maybe even more relevant. I used to lead a coalition for Charge Ahead California. I co-led with a number of other EJ and climate organizations. And what we were working to do is realize that right now across the state of California and really across the country, we don't have opportunities or choices around mobility, right? We don't have transportation choice. And too often you're stuck in a gas guzzler or in a, a hoopty, we used to call it, but in a car that's really kind of on its last legs. I know, I'm either the last person to still use this word. Um, clunkers, they call it now. <laughs> but, you know, in a lot of communities in the rural areas, you don't have a choice. You know, in some of the places right outside of Fresno, it takes four hours to get from Huron to Fresno Children's Hospital in a community where one out of four kids actually have asthma. We have um, an increase in the suburbanization of poverty when you have um, the gentrification of urban communities, which we talked about at the top of the show, it's pushing a lot of people to the suburbs. And then we were seeing this suburbanization of poverty where they don't have transportation choices and people are spending up to a half of their income just to commute back to the city for their jobs. And then you have the urban communities where people are waiting for hours at a t an hour at a time to get to their jobs even because they don't have reliable buses, they don't have reliable um, transportation choices. And a lot of times the housing stock in areas where people can afford it are by busy roads and highways. So when you look, which have cars spewing out tailpipe pollutions, which is essentially refineries on wheels, spewing out pollution into their windows. And I live by a busy road or highway. I live by a busy road right now. You hear a lot of cars going by. And so when you look at the confluence of factors happening in our communities, you can't just say, well, this is the way it is and we have to throw up our hands. We have to actually begin to look at what are the ways we then create responsive transportation choices that meets people where they are given the factors in their communities. And this coalition, our group, created Charge Ahead California, which looked at actually creating options. And so to Derek's point, we understood the price point for electric vehicles were way out of reach for most families. So we said, well, what if we combined some of these programs? What if we had the cash for clunkers program match with our electric vehicle subsidies and then we combine them? And then we actually increase that amount in areas that were just really polluted with pollution like Fresno or Huron. And when we did that, we could bring the cost of the electric vehicles down from uh, in 2012, it was a 2012 uh, secondhand vehicle. It went from, it was, 
it was what 30 something thousand, it brought down to $5,000 for a family of four that could actually use it. Now there's a whole bunch of problems we have to figure out around the charging infrastructure. And I can talk about that as well. But we also would create it in Huron when we understood that problem. We said, well, what, what can we actually do that responds to the needs in the community? And we created an electric van pool. And that allowed for farm workers to actually use electric vans that they could then go to not only your children's hospital, but actually go to nearby kind of you know, grocery stores or other needs, especially important for farm workers who may not have a driver's license, right? And so then we also looked at how do we be, create increased um, buses, fuel cell buses and electric buses in urban communities so that they have more reliability, more, like more regular routes from the bu for buses. And that allowed for us to begin to patch even more transportation choices. So I will say it's, a, it's, a, it's too quick for us to say, this is a future, they're gonna take away all of our cars. No, we're gonna create even more transportation choices. We're actually gonna increase mobility and we're actually gonna be creating community solutions with the community. And that's the work that we need to be doing. Greg froze again, stand by please. I think there's some real questions there about uh, COVID and, and cars. If you're just joining us, we're talking about uh, racial race issues and, and fossil fuels in America with Derek Colley, president of Reaching America, Jackie Patterson, director of the environmental and climate justice at the NAACP, Ivan Penn, energy reporter with the New York Times, and Van Trung, director of climate justice with the Tom Steyer PAC. Um, Jack, Jackie, I'd like to go to you and you have a pamphlet from the NAACP, top 10 manipulation tactics of fossil fuel companies. And particularly there's three of them there about exaggerating the level of job creation, pacifier co-opt community leaders and praising false solutions. Tell us a little bit about some of those tactics that you see on the part of fossil fuel companies. Uh, so whether it's the, the Keystone pipeline or it is even some of the other coal plants that are being built in communities or otherwise, that often there will be promise of, of jobs, but not really the kind of specificity that these are only construction jobs that are only going to last so long or there's going to be jobs coming into the community, but we're also bringing people who already have those jobs into the community. So those are the kind of things that we're finding in different um, places where the the promises don't actually match the the the, the reality. And then, of course, there's the fact that the well, that that was a that was another one of the top ten. So, but you didn't ask about that one <laughs> in terms of the job safety. But um, so then, in terms of the uh, attempting to pacify or co-op communities, it is definitely whether it's uh, the, so it's one thing, there, uh, sometimes uh, some of the companies will say that they're just wanting to be a good neighbor in terms of providing financial support to communities, which is how some of our communities say, oh, great, they want to be a good neighbor. And so that's, that's great. We'll take that. And then there is the times like um, President Wazy talked about and others, how they will, uh, they will tie that, those financial contributions to the community supporting their position very explicitly. And in, uh, in the report, we talked about the St. Louis. Hey, hey Jackie, pardon me one second. Can I ask you to move your mic up? Oh, yeah. sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the St. Louis NAACP uh, talked about how they were receiving funds every year. And then one year they said, oh, um, we didn't get our check this year for our Freedom Fund banquet. We're just, you know, checking up just to make sure it didn't get lost in the mail or something. And they said, oh, you know, we give money. Yes, we give money to our friends. But your people went and testified at the EPA um, hearing on mercury and air toxics. Therefore, you are no longer in the friend category. So the check was not indeed lost in the mail. It never was sent out. And so these are the kind of things where it's starting to be revealed, the basis of some of these relationships. And so. Ivan Penn, you re you've recited a uh, study that said from 2013 to 2017, 10 of the country's largest utilities gave out about a billion dollars in donations. Where did that money go? What did the companies get for those donations to community and nonprofits? Well, I mean, it, it's a variety of places. And uh, so everything from uh, your, your nonprofit organizations, um, your, your, the NAACP, the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Clubs, um, you know, it's, a, it, it, it gets, and, and arts events, um, which are, were, uh, 
getting their names put on performing arts centers mm -hmm. and parks. And, um, and I, I remember a, uh, I remember a um, state senator in Florida said uh, uh, that they saw uh, in, in that particular case, Duke Energy as just a, a, good, um, a, a good public citizen to the state of Florida. And, and didn't realize uh, some of the uh, some of the issues that that were there because uh, there was a particular problem uh, with a broken uh, nuclear plant um, that ended up costing consumers um, hundreds of millions uh, of dollars and and they were charging in advance for another plant and um, and that cost consumers a billion and a half. Um, and, and so when, when the Senator looked at it all, he was like, well, you know, it, it, because of all the things that they do in, in the community, um, you know, we saw them as a good corporate citizen. And, mm. and then it makes it difficult for, I mean, who's going to come to a public hearing and speak out against the entity whichever one it is, whether it's a utility, an oil company, um, natural gas company, that is basically funding their entire budget, essentially. I mean, because it doesn't have to be a whole lot of money for a nonprofit to, to, to have their entire budget funded. Uh, and then it's a drop in the bucket for you know, corporations of these, uh, the sizes of the utilities and oil companies. Uh, it makes it difficult uh, for anyone to, to, to speak out against the, the hand that's feeding them. But in fact, I think Ivan Penn, there was one point in uh, New Orleans where you couldn't even get <clears throat> members of the city council to talk to you about a, a proposed uh, natural gas plant. Is that right? That, that's right. It was, um, uh, it was actually in the course of reporting about uh, the the NAACP story that we learned about New Orleans, and we ended up separating out that story and and saw some great reporting by the the local uh, the local journalist there in New Orleans. Um, but it was it's a really incredible tale of uh, the utility there pushing for a natural gas plant in this day and time when there uh, are our alternatives. Um, that even a former council member tried to push. But when we went to talk to, went in city hall to talk to the New Orleans city council members, not a single one would come and talk to me or, or call me, except there was one who, who did give me the statement, uh, I can't, I can't comment because we're being sued. Um, and, and, but that, that, was, that was the only one that actually gave any kind of statement, but none of them would actually would agree to an interview. Um, and, and, and that was an incident where you had some of the astroturfing. Uh, you had a public relations firm hired by the utility company that literally paid people who thought they were actually going to be in a um, an, an an ad or 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 something. They were actually thought that I'm just being paid as an actor, and they ended up in city hall uh, and at a hearing about the power plant. And that's when they discovered that oh, th wow. it, what they weren't acting; they were <laughs> actually being paid to speak in favor of a power plant. Uh, but that that's the degree. That, that you see some, some of these actions. Jen Trung, I wanna talk about, we're talking about the energy transition. We have to talk about unions, uh, often thought as you know, support on the left, uh, but they support a lot of the pipelines that are proposed around the country, a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure. And the reality is, you know, there are not as many permanent jobs for some renewable energy facilities as Ivan Penn said once, you know, solar plant is a you know guy with a squeegee running around, you know, cleaning the panels. Um, so Bien Trong, you know, where are unions on this transition? Are they also kind of holding to those well-paying fossil fuel jobs? Because a lot of renewable energy jobs are not unionized. Yeah, I, I think what we want to unpack first is not to conflate the jobs 
with the with their kind of um, position on climate, because really when they're looking at what these projects are, they're looking at what the jobs and the job quality tied around these projects are. And I want to maybe dig a little bit dig deeper on that, because what we know and maybe too often conflate is the interconnections between cheap labor and the rising CO2 emissions, right? It's the same logic that is driving for maximum profit that is using kind of um, unsavory uh, tactics from paying people to put, uh, for testify, testify in support of projects to maximizing profit by any means necessary, including making sure that they're, um, you know, working laborers uh, for pennies, burning up coal, bur you know, it, blowing up mountaintops to get to the coal. It's the underlying logic of by any means necessary, we're going to get our profit. We're gonna get, um, you know, these, uh, these projects moving forward. And that's something that we have to really make sure that we're looking at. You know, when Jackie noted that we have to um, make sure that the green jobs we're talking about in the past is not actually bad jobs. That, you know, we're talking about how do we make sure we're creating good jobs? And you know the great work that NAACP is doing around making sure that they're raising the quality of jobs across the green energy sector, the clean energy sector, making sure that we're investing in communities so that the good jobs are actually based in communities, um, that the, these are uh, accessible to by people across the spectrum. Um, those are the things that we have to continue to dig at. And we should not be creating a opposition between um, what is good for the community and what is good for the economy. We have to make sure that we're continuing to do that um, well and both. And for us, when we're doing this work, we have to make sure we're looking at the interconnections of investing in communities, investing in good jobs and making sure that we're um, not putting sacrifice zones, um, you know, that we're not sacrificing people in lieu of uh, making the jobs real. So for me, you know, it's like we, that highlights a responsibility for us then to make sure that we're actually not only doubling down and creating the good, creating the clean energy jobs, but making sure that those jobs are actually as good and pays good wages, that they actually reflect the standard of living and the standard of pay that we have to get people to, that we create wraparound benefits around that. And then we have to make sure that, that there's a pipeline into those good jobs for communities across the board. We have a question from listener Christina who asks about the early closure of fossil fuel plants. What's the impact on electricity rates? Who pays? Is securitization a solution? Ivan Pan, we're getting toward the end. If you could quickly address the what happens? We see nuclear power plants close, uh, coal plants close. What happens? Well, I mean, it's a mixed bag. Um, but in, but in in short, because uh, there's a question of who owns it. Uh, if the utility company owns it, then uh, if they close early, the rate the the ratepayers, the the utilities customers, they are having to to pick up the tab. If the plant is owned by uh, what's referred to as the merchant power producers, those who are selling uh, the the power to the utility company, uh, that company has uh, you know they're on the hook, and and that's less of an impact. On, on the on the utility customers, but um, now you have an overall picture of you know well how does that affect um, the the supply and does that raise energy costs because you don't have as much availability, but it's not as direct an impact as if the utility owns it. Jackie Passon, I feel like as we get to the end here, I want to make sure that we connect uh, the COVID. Uh, vulnerability. Of, of, we know that uh, African Americans have higher incidence of asthma. They're more vulnerable to COVID. They're likely to be living in these fence line communities. So, how is that impacting? I want to make sure we we hit that. Don't overlook. Yeah, that. yeah. No, it's so many ways. One, we certainly see have seen the Harvard study that caught that ties PM two point five, which is particulate matter, um, to COVID. Says that 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 indicates that COVID actually rides on these two point these particulate matter particles and so we and we know that those uh, the particulate matter is much higher in black communities in particular from sources including uh, the any type of burning whether you know combustion whether it's through coal plants or through car engines or through burning of incinerators and, and so forth so that is certainly there plus the as you said the his, the history of having compromised lung capacity from ha from being near near the way 
near roadway air pollution and, and so forth and so on means that we're more vulnerable to um, COVID-19, which, uh, which impacts the lungs. So all those different ways. And then on top of it all, as Vian was talking about, and um, in terms of the transportation challenges of our communities, means that if we are less mobile in terms of having individual cars, then in order to, whether it's get to places to get food or, or, or do the essential work because we're more likely to be essential workers, it means that we're the ones who are getting on these buses where there's more likely to be transmission. Mm. Time and time again, you talk, you hear people talk about how it's so much safer riding in your individual cars, and many of us don't even have that choice. Um, and so there's so many intersections there. So I'll stop there. Oh, yeah. Can, can I add something to this? You know, I think it's really important when we see the protests that are happening now across the country, it makes so much sense to me. That anger is justified. We are facing the uh, economic injustice, the racial injustice, the environmental injustice that this pandemic has really revealed to this country, right? We're seeing the mm -hmm. breakdown of our institutions that's supposed to keep us safe from hospitals to energy to housing. Those things are crumbling. We're seeing people who with the end of the um, moratorium on evictions, we're seeing people being displaced in mass. And on top of it all, we're on top of it all. We're seeing the PPP funds and loans that are supposed to going to help protect people, the emergency um, support. It's going to actually the wealthier folks, right? You know, when you look at who is actually getting the PPP loans, you have um, TGI Fridays. You have you know a bunch of these. Or, you have Kanye West, who's gotten two to five million dollars. Um, you've gotten you know. Jared Kushner's friends got a ton of PPP loans. The folks who did not get the loans though, 90% of small businesses did not get PPP loans. And when you look in California alone, most of the most of the small um, restaurants, most of the nail salons, most of the service industries, they are people who are um, primarily, most of, the, most of these small businesses are actually led by people of color. Most of them actually hired from the community, actually are being, are, um, reinvesting back into the economy. So when we're not actually creating a safeguard for these industries, we're actually going to see an even bigger gap between the have and the have nots. And then to make that even worse, we're looking at the digital divide where students are now being um, asked to l learn remotely when a lot of families don't even have Wi-Fi or laptops at home. And so we're going to see this wealth inequality continue to get even worse if we don't do something about it. So I say we got to take a look now at making sure that this this reveal that we've seen with the pandemic actually forces us to focus on investing in the communities that are the front lines, that are in the sacrifice zone and make those our sacred work right now. We have to wrap Amen. up. Yeah, um, yeah, um, Derek, Ali, I saw you nodding yes to a lot, to a lot of that. Yeah, I, I was just gonna, I, I, you missed me, but I was saying amen to Ben. She said it all. And so <laughs> we, she, she, she said it all. And we have to look at right now what COVID has done to this country. It has, in many ways, pulled back the covers on all of our dirty secrets, things that are wrong in this country. And I think if any, if order for us to pull ourselves out right now, we're going to have to all come together. Can't be no left, can't be no right, can't be no white. This is an American issue right now. And, uh, the most vulnerable do you, do you think people Donald are the Trump, ones. Uh, Derek, do you think Donald Trump is doing that? It's hard to say right now. If you look at, if you look at what's going on, it, it, it would be hard to say that uh, there is unity right now in this country. And I think we're going to have to get past this divide that exists before we can pull ourselves out of this situation that we're in right now. We have to wrap it up there. I'd like to thank our Climate One crew for making this happen from their homes. We'll uh, clean up this audio. That's the beauty of radio editing. We'll clean up the audio for the uh, radio show and podcast. We had some... Uh, video bumps today. On Climate One today, we've been discussing oil refineries and power plants that generate jobs and pollution in the communities where they operate. We heard about their complex relationship with communities of color, how they're often better at public relations than environmental groups. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests today were Derek Hawley, president of Reaching America, Jackie Patterson, director of environmental and climate justice at the NAACP, Ivan Penn is an energy reporter of the New York Times, and Vian Trong, speaking for herself, her day job is Director of Climate Justice at the Tom Steyer PAC. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your podcasts. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. 
Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you.